Hi, everyone. Welcome. I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to the symposium on advancing participant engagement in BCI research, who, why, and how. So my name is Ashley Feinsinger. I'm a neuroethicist at UCLA. I'll be moderating this symposium today. Um, I want to thank our four speakers for being here with us. Um, we'll have um, Jennifer French, who is the executive director and founder of Neurotech Network, who will be speaking from her experiences and expertise um, in community uh, engagement and advocacy. We have Dr. Jennifer Collinger, who is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we also have Phil McKenzie, who is here with us virtually. He is a BCI user and current study participant. And we also have Dr. Nader Paradian, who is professor and chair of the Department of Neurological Surgery at the University UT Southwestern. So what I'll do just briefly in the beginning is just share what the session goals and maybe do a little bit of background information um, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. So the goals for this session are to really broadly introduce the state of engagement in BCI research, what's being done and what we're currently missing, to share experiences and expertise around participant engagement in BCI research, discussing some of the successes and current challenges, um, hopefully discuss with all of you ways of increasing engagement with participants and the frameworks, resources, and research needed to do so, um, and just a, a rough timeline. I think each of the speakers will talk maybe around 12 minutes, no more than 15 minutes, and then we'll have a lot of time for Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll start that off with some questions to the panel, and uh, then we'll take um, audience questions and virtual questions. So just to get started, so what do we mean for the purposes of this panel when we talk about BCIs? I think the term brain-computer interface can be used to describe a wide range of devices. For this panel, we are focusing a little bit more narrowly on devices um, where there is real-time processing of neural data to provide input into the device. Um, so that would include kind of paradigmatic examples of brain-computer interfaces for movement and speech. I think we'll also include things like visual prostheses and spinal cord simulators. Um, I think, you know, we are focused mostly on implanted devices, although there are BCI devices that are not implanted. Um, and also focusing on research that is in the early feasibility stage. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what that is and why that raises um, really unique ethical motivations for engagement. Um, these studies also involve a really unique level of commitment from their participants, also changing the ethical landscape, and um, likely also involves something called moral entanglement, which hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit about through the talks in our Q&A. Um, so what is engagement? I think for the purposes of this discussion, you know, participant engagement refers to a cluster of approaches to research that aim to involve participants in the research process beyond their traditional role as passive subjects. And there are a wide range of practices that fall under this name. There are a wide range of motivations that fall under this range. And I think part of the point of this panel is to discuss those, which, which are we doing really well, which are we not doing really well, and how can we kind of move the needle. Engagement can be done all throughout study design, so pre-trial, during trial, and post-trial. So where are we doing really well with participants and where can we do better? Um, and engagement can also happen with a, with a wide range of groups. So we could be engaging with society more broadly, so asking questions about public perceptions about BCI research. We could be engaging with advocacy organizations to try to align the device development with, um, you know, the goals of of those organizations. We could be engaging with clinical populations, so people who have spinal cord injury, for example. Um, we could be engaging with future and past participants in some of these BCI studies, but we could also be engaging with participants as they are in the studies. And I think this, this last part is where I hope we will get some, some discussion today of what are some of the challenges of involving participants who have really given a significant amount of their time and taken on significant risks to develop these devices for future, for future participants and patients. I think um, despite widespread endorsement for engagement in BCI studies and neurotechnology studies more generally, um, from researchers, ethicists, participants themselves, um, 
participant engagement in particular, as opposed to or in addition to community engagement or public engagement, has not gotten much focused attention. There are no current best practices or in an, ethic, an ethicist standpoint, sufficient guidelines for what engaging with participants pre, during, and post these studies should be. Um, but this is not for a lack of moral motivation or opportunity. So we're really kind of stuck, um, I think, in moving this forward. Um, I think our, our speakers will talk about these more in depth, but I just want to give plant the seed a little bit. So there have been a cluster of moral justifications offered for um, participant engagement. These include things like when we engage participants in these studies, it leads to increased benefit for them. It could help us better understand what consent should look like, what the post-trial landscape is, and how we can support these patients after the studies. It could also lead to a, um, a better designing of these devices for and with disabled people, uh, making sure that they're developed in line with the goals of disabled populations. Some people have put forward that engagement is a way of recognizing, so justice as recognition of the epistemic privilege, values, and lived experiences of these participants. Um, and it has also been preferred as responding to a vulnerability and a dependence that some of these participants have um, on the researchers who run these studies. But of course, um, involving participants in a more significant way in these early phase research perhaps faces some challenges and barriers. And I hope we'll, we'll get a little bit more in depth as to what those barriers are. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll stop talking and I'll, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, who is Jen French. And, uh, Pass you the clicker. Yes, the clicker. Thanks, Ashley. And thank you all for joining us today. I hope uh, we can have a lively discussion after these um, very quick kind of, uh, I wouldn't call them lightning round, but quick presentations to kind of set the tone of what we're talking about. So I'm Jen French. I'm from Neurotech Network. We're a nonprofit organization that focuses on education and advocacy of neurotechnology devices, therapies, and treatments. We work a lot with, um, with advocacy organizations, but we also work with a lot of device developers on how to do meaningful engagement. I also want to point out a, a very important organization um, in this community, which is the American Brain Coalition. I'm a proud board member of the American Brain Coalition, and really the work that they do in terms of working with, uh, or I should say we do, in terms of working with advocacy organizations, with researchers like yourself, with institutions, with other professional organizations to coalesce uh, advancing research in the brain space. So what I wanna talk a little bit about, were, what are some of the opportunities and what are some of the challenges that we see in the BCI field? And you all might look at me and go, well, what in the world experience do you have? And sometimes I shake my head at that as well and I, um, I really need to reflect on what experience that, that, that I can bring to the table as we talk about this. So I was not always in a seated position. I spent, um, at, as of this year, half of my life um, as, a, uh, as a, a person of able body and up and moving around. So I was an avid snowboarder and very much in the finance and tech business. Um, but I did have a snowboarding accident which left me living with tetraplegia uh, several years ago. And, and a year and a half, after that injury, I actually joined a clinical trial. And that clinical trial is an implanted neuroprosthesis. So I want you to think about this. I have been in a clinical trial for 25 years. Um, and it allows me to do things that I think the researchers never thought of um, in terms of, you know, I thought for this audience it would be fun to go out and play foosball while I'm standing using the neuroprosthesis. It's definitely something that we don't do in the lab, but are things that we can learn about the interaction of devices as we develop them. But I think as we think about post-trials and access to devices, if I wasn't in this trial for a long time, I would not be still be able to use this device 25 years later. But I think for this discussion, we should bring it back to our, our, our advocate that really speaks to the voice of lived experience, which is Michael J. Fox. And this statement is so true and so pervasive as we think about developing neurotech devices, is that the people living with the condition are experts. And I know there's many of you that study these, but think about those with lived experience live with this condition 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So respecting that 
perspective that they can bring to the table are things that we can't always study in published papers or we can't always study in textbooks, but that we can learn from that lived experience. So keep that perspective as we talk through this. I also think that definitions are important, and I know Ashley set this up, but, uh, but when we think about participation engagement and community engagement, we have to think about them in two different aspects. So when we think about participation engagement, it is interacting with the person in that clinical study, whether they're involved in that study in that time or involved with it at the end of that study. That is still a study participant, and they bring a different perspective to the table. But when we think about community engagement, we're bringing in the broader community of lived experience and working collaboratively with other and through other groups of people with lived experience throughout the research and development process. So all the way through the development process to even post-approval and post-market access. So thinking about these definitions, let's first dive into participant engagement. And really when we think about some of these early users, these early users can start to tell us stories and open the window to how they interact with the devices that we have. So I do have two early BCI users here talking about independence, talking about the, the, the difference that using that robotic arm made to Jan, but also about some of the other brain interface or even neural interface early users when we talk about Nobody can see it when I go out in public, uh, which means a lot when people are out interacting in the world. They don't want to always show that their disability is visible. Um, and also, you know, Dennis's quote, I think, is beautiful in the fact that, you know, once you get used to it, you can't live without it. So we have to think about when we're developing these devices and they become interacted in people's worlds, these participants are, are really pervasive and we can learn a lot from them. But there are gains and concerns that we have to consider when we're looking at participant engagement. So we're looking at the gains. We can gain a lot. You know, we are in a phase in the brain initiative where we have a lot of first in humans. We have a lot of early devices and we have a lot to learn from these participants. We're getting firsthand insights into use cases that we couldn't have even dreamed of in our labs. We're getting the understanding of the early interventions and how we need to do adaptability of our devices to be able to fit the needs of the end user. We we'll also have an opportunity to build a relationship between the researcher and the participant so we can really have an open conversation and an open dialogue. And it also opens up the idea for idea generation of thinking about the next generation or the next phase of your studies. But there are concerns that we have to draw to the table and be very aware of and make sure that we don't fall into those holes. So when we think about the vulnerabilities, I know Ashley mentioned this, so that, that participants can be in a vulnerable position. Think about somebody sitting at an operating room table and you're asking them to make a decision, which is it can really put somebody into a vulnerable decision, uh, the situation. But also thinking about the limited scope. These participants are only a few people out of a big population. Um, and also understanding the power structures that can exist between a researcher or a clinical coordinator and a research participant. There is this power structure there that we have to be very conscious of, that we make sure that we don't over, overuse that or overstep those lines. And of course, uh, uh, Ashley mentioned the, the ethical entanglements. And also, this is an important point, is when we think about participant engagement, many times we can't compensate them, but we are asking for their advice way beyond the design of the study, and they are not getting compensated for that time. You are compensating a statistician, maybe for what their time is after that, but we're not compensating the participants. So think about how we, how we engage in their time outside of the protocols of the study. Now, when we think about community engagement, in the patient engagement world, where their patient advocacy world, where you know, a lot of us, some of us live, is that there are very sophisticated organizations that help to train their constituents on how to engage with research, how do we engage with the public, how do we engage with policymakers, how do we engage with regulators and payers to make sure that the voice is heard. And these are just a, a swath of some of the organizations that do training uh, with their constituents um, and what they call our ambassadors. And those ambassadors are able to do two things. One, they're able to tell the story about understanding that lived experience, but two, they're able to talk about 
the broader community and be able to reflect on that broader community and be able to speak to the voice of the broader community because they've been trained on that perspective. And why is that important? Well, this is from actually our friends over at FDA uh, talk about some of the, the potential results of engaging the community. So when we think about design, when we think about um, involving diverse populations, when we think about participant commitment and retention and follow up, some of that community engagement can help address some of those perils before we even begin the trials where community engagement can help to address some of those concerns early on. It can also help in terms of understanding the relevant data for those outcomes. Are the outcomes and the data that you're pulling out of your clinical study relevant to the, the lived experience population? How do we get some greater involvement in terms of lesser, uh, lower protocol amendments, as well as um, you know, deviations from your protocols? This is where we can spot out some of the perils that can happen in trials. So speaking of FDA, actually they have guidance on engagement, and which leads me to, you know, I started with the definition of in, uh, participant engagement versus community engagement. And this is actually language that is in their guidance that goes into what is a, part a research participant different from an advisor? And that puts them into two separate roles. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't engage with our participants, but it means that if we are looking for an advisor to understand from a community perspective, those are able to give you a view of the, the broader community compared to the view of the understanding of actually using that device. And I also want to point out the definition of engagement, which is really critical in this guidance, which means that it's meaningful interactions with patients that provide opportunities, and this is important, mutual learning and effective collaboration. Again, mutual learning and effective collaboration. So we're not just sitting in a room and say, talk to me, nor are you just getting in a room and talking to the, the people with lived experience. It is an interactive, iterative process. So let's think about this. So this is a classic, I'm an MBA, so I had to put this up there. This is a classic adoption curve. When we look at adoption of anything, if it's your cell phone or a laptop on your, on your lap, or any type of technology, when we look at the early adopters, those are the people who are the innovators, they're the early people. When we think about this in terms of engagement as we develop these devices, when we're talking to participants, we're talking to those early innovators, we're talking to those early advisors, right? When we're starting to do community engagement, we are starting to look at the mainstream market. We are helping to jump that chasm, and that's where I think we can help in terms of the wider adoption of these devices to help these conversations. Another pervasive area that we see in community engagement is many times we think about the devices within the medical model of disability. So many times we think that we want to be cured, we, uh, we live around our condition and only our condition, but the reality of it is, is many people are out in society with chronic conditions and we have to take the social model into place, which was the quote from Tony that said, I can go out with an implant in my head and nobody can see it. It's really important to him. So think about that of the medical model versus the social model. Now, when we think about models of engagement, I know Ashley mentioned this, but there are actually lots of models of engagement and I'm not gonna go into all of them today, but I am. this is one that I'm just gonna throw up there just to, just to seed the thought for today. This uh, looks familiar. The top of it was actually from an original paper published by our friend Heather and, uh, and Jean Sidilico at FDA, but it's been adapted by the patient-focused medicine development out of the UK. And they added some layers um, that in, when we have to start thinking of, of engagement in terms of legal and compliance and procurement, but it really kind of points out where along the development spectrum that we can start to do engagement. There's also mechanisms of engagement as well, and this was actually developed out of PCORI, um, and you can find this here, but when we think about the spectrum of engagement, so many times we go, oh, okay, we wanna do specific interviews or run focus groups or do a community survey. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. When we start to think about how we further move along the perspective of, or, and the spectrum of engagement, how do we look at building consultations, building true collaboration between those that are the lived experience with your research team 
and also how do we get into this shared shared leadership. So looking along that spectrum of how we can further develop it. You can't jump into the end result, but you, we can move along that spectrum to have a more meaningful engagement practices. And this is not new. Community engagement is actually pervasive around the world. There's many global players in this, and I just wanted I just put up a few of them here just to 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 to, to point it out to you that there are many organizations working on community engagement and many practices actually have been built out of the pharmaceutical areas, but there are now practices that are being published and guidance for medical device development that we really need to consider in this community. So bringing it back, where are we falling short in, in BCIs or even in you know, implanted neural prosthesis? Where are we falling short when it comes to engagement? Well, where we're, from my view, where we're falling short is in terms of training and guidance just for our research investigators as well as for our funders um, to really kind of set the stage so that we, we have the funding in place to do meaningful engagement, but we also are trained on doing meaningful engagement. Understanding this real world experience and how do we capture that, I think is another area that is bleeding for development as well as the performance metrics and ethical considerations, and of course, the involvement of the care partners or caregivers are critical, and that's one area where we're missing. I just wanna go into very quickly the implantable BCI collaborative community. I believe my partner in CC is somewhere in the audience, um, but this is a collaborative community that we just launched three months ago, but really understanding the concept of collaborative communities. So when we think about the field of implantable BCIs, we have to really think about having a community that unleashes our collective process, our progress, our shared knowledge, and also our interdisciplinary collaborations, addressing these challenges as we move on innovation. And that's what a collaborative community is. It's developed actually um, as bringing stakeholders together and bringing in public and private stakeholders, but also having a common objective. And there are very key points in collaborative communities. These are not kumbayas, but they really are key points. One is that they need to be transparent. One, they need to have diverse stakeholders. And here, these are two key points, and I can't go into them now, but the understanding the pre-competitive space, that doesn't mean pre-market, that means pre-competitive so that we can all work together to solve collective problems, but also the development of something called regulatory science so we can further develop these technologies. So with the implantable BCI, IBCI, CC, we are fostering collaboration with diverse stakeholders, and you can see all those stakeholders up there, to really go accelerate the development in safety and efficacy and also further access of implantable BCI. So we ask for you to join, come visit our website, apply and we would love to have you involved. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So next we'll have um, Dr. Jen Collinger talk a little bit about the details of, of her, the BCI studies that she's involved with and uh, share a little bit about her experiences and challenges with participant engagement. All right, thank you for having me. I'll see if I can get my slides. There we go. Okay, okay. Um, so I, I'm Jen Collinger from the University of Pittsburgh. I've been working with implanted BCIs for over 10 years. And my job today is to really zoom in and tell you a little bit about one specific study so that everybody has the same kind of background when we're talking about participant engagement for BCIs. Now, oh, Ashley introduced some of the specific challenges related to BCI research and why we chose this as a model, but I wanna start with a few definitions. So these studies are being conducted under an investigational device exemption from the FDA. These are required for studies or devices that pose a significant risk to the health, safety, or welfare of a subject. This could include implants, devices that support or sustain human life, devices that are important in diagnosing, curing, mitigating, or treating disease, or in preventing impairment to human health. These are also devices that remain permanently implanted, or that are placed in the body, and they're considered permanent um, if they're in for 30 days or more. 
And IDEs at this point um, often have been led by academic groups, um, but they can also be led by industry as we're starting to move into early feasibility and, and pivotal trials. Um, and just so everybody knows, you have approval from the FDA as well as a local institutional review board who provides oversight. So I've been saying, mentioning this term early feasibility study that has a specific definition, again, from the FDA. So these are limited clinical investigations of a device that are early in development. So that's kind of the theme of devices that we're talking about today. Typically, these studies have a small number of participants. It's used to evaluate a device design concept um, with regards to safety and maybe some initial um, investigations of device functionality. And it could de um, guide device modifications in the future. All right, so now that we have those definitions, I just want to tell you a little bit about the study that we're conducting in Pittsburgh. It's not unique necessarily. There are other groups that are doing similar work. But essentially, the device that we are evaluating is an intracortical, bidirectional brain-computer interface. And so what that means is that we implant electrodes in motor cortex, shown here in blue. We record activity from small groups of neurons. We try to decode those patterns of activity to control a device. Here I'm showing a robotic arm. We can record from sensors in those devices. Um, here we're recording the interaction forces with an object, and then we can turn that into stimulation patterns that are then played through electrodes and somatosensory cortex to hopefully restore the sense of touch. And now I want to tell you a little bit more um, about exactly how that happens as part of our study. So this study is a multi-site trial happening at the University of Pittsburgh as well as at the University of Chicago. Um, the overall goal, as defined in the study, is to test the long-term safety and some preliminary evidence towards efficacy of this sensory motor BCI. We are targeting people who have chronic upper limb impairments who report no functional use um, of their hands. This is considered a significant risk study. Obviously, there's surgery and all of the associated risks that go along with that. Um, and at this point, there's really no direct benefit to participants. This is a device that will be implanted temporarily, even if for years. Most of the time, they're using it in the lab. I think Nader will expand a little bit on, you know, sort of indirect benefits of, of these types of studies. But ultimately, we're really trying to contribute to evidence that will allow us to develop devices to help people with tetraplegia or upper limb impairment in the future. And in our study design, participants are typically completing about three days a week of testing with us, either in the lab or in their home. And our study duration could be for anywhere from a year to up to 10 years post-implant. So this is quite a long time that participants are working with us. And you know, that's one of the reasons that um, we really want them to be able to share their experience as they're in the study, to be able to be nimble in the study design and adapt to their feedback. So participants, when they hear about our study through um, our various recruitment mechanisms, will contact us. We go through a phone screening to see if they may be eligible, um, and we start to share information about the study. So they have access to the consent form and other information that's approved by the review boards. If they're still interested, we schedule a series of pre-consent visits. And so these um, are pretty structured, and they were based on feedback from our IRB and from our Data and Safety Monitoring Board, where we talk about um, the study procedures, what they'll actually be doing. They meet with the neurosurgeon to discuss the study risks. We also meet with a family member or caregiver as part of the pre-consent process. Then there's another visit to obtain an informed consent. Obviously, everyone knows that's a process. It's not just the signing of a document. But again, we talk about the procedures, risks, benefits, that this is completely voluntary, um, and the participant and a caregiver participates in this. We have a number of screening visits that happen prior to the implant. So there's some basic questionnaires that people fill out. They actually meet with a rehab neuropsychologist who follows them throughout the duration of the study regarding psychosocial support and sort of understanding and expectations about the study. And then we do some screening to help us know where to place the electrodes with fMRI. Um, we may do some EEGs, so some non-invasive BCI experiments with them ahead of time. Again, to give them that experience of coming into the lab, what is it like to conduct this research, which is you know, a lot of repetitive science. Um, it's not just coming in to do cool demonstrations. It's really working hard to better understand the brain to develop better devices. And then there's the clinical pre-op prior to surgery. 
Then obviously, at some point when we've gone through all of this and the participant agrees, we do uh, the implant, our neurosurgeon does that, there's a surgical consent and they stay in the hospital for post-op care. And then BCI testing, I'm reducing down here to one block, but this is that, you know, typically three days a week, one to five days a week, um, where they're coming in to do all of the experiments. We're obviously collecting all of the data we need to assess the safety of the implant and the initial efficacy, um, but we're also trying to further our understanding of motor control and sensory feedback to improve the device. Um, in our study, they have a monthly physical to check for any changes in motor or sensory function, and then they also meet quarterly with our neuropsychologist. And then finally, at the end of the study, in our study design, the device is eventually explanted. We don't have the expectation that it will continue to function indefinitely. Um, and so we do remove the device at the end, and there is some follow-up care both clinically and with the neuropsychologist afterwards. Um, generally touched on the, the challenge with participant engagement very nicely. I just kind of maybe want to speak to it a little bit from a researcher perspective. So obviously we work with small numbers of participants. In our trial we've had six people um, between the multiple sites and still, you know, everybody does have different opinions and desires, um, but it is representing a very small uh, group of people both who've had a BCI and those who've chosen not to have a BCI. Like we need to design for a broader um, population. There are challenges with privacy. Um, so I think that, you know, obviously in participating in outreach um, events like this, people, you know, do reveal that they are participating in a study. And so that's something that we have to navigate and balance, um, you know, who, who decides if that is appropriate um, and, and what concerns do we really have so that people can consent to that appropriately. Obviously we're doing you know, science, both we're trying to do the clinical trial, we're doing NIH funded science, and we need to make sure that we do this work rigorously and minimize any bias in our study design. So there are some aspects of the study that participants can provide feedback on that we can change and others that we maybe can't. And as mentioned, you know, I think there's a lack of guidance and process. So there is a lot of guidance regarding community engagement, but for participant engagement, people who are currently enrolled in studies, I don't think there's as many formal processes about how to actually go about doing that in a um, structured way. So um, in terms of community engagement for BCI, as Jen mentioned, we're scratching the surface. You know, so. I think it's become pretty common to require or um, want to include community advisors as you're developing a grant or um, to maybe even assess progress on a uh, project that's going on. Um, but the main way that I think the BCI field has really targeted uh, the community is through end user surveys. And you know, it kind of progresses as the devices have developed. So the study from Kim Anderson was just asking people with spinal cord injury about their functional priorities for recovery. That may be guided, you know, why would people even start to develop BCIs in the first place to try to tackle some of those things. Um, we conducted a study really in the early days of BCI to try to find out what people might want to do with it and what de design criteria they would have. And then there was a more recent study um, from from the Stanford group and Braingate group here. Now that there have been some demonstrations of BCI and we have an idea of what's possible, let's zoom in a little bit more to try to see the um, sort of benefits and trade-offs that people would make based on the BCI type and the function that's provided. In terms of participant engagement, you know, in some ways we're always engaging with our participants at every step in human subjects research, participation is voluntary and so by nature of doing human subjects research, we need to engage with them and ensure that they want to continue their participation. We obtain both formal and informal feedback during our research sessions. Um, this can be, you know, as insig you know, insignificant of, oh, I think I might change this, you know, just the way this is displayed to actually driving new lines of research. So developing technology that's more portable that can go into the home, um, adding sensory feedback, uh, these are things that, that are motivated a lot by participants um, giving us feedback about how things are working and what would make it better. We get input from them on how to reduce barriers to participation, either from for the people in the study currently or for people who are thinking about doing that. That might be transportation, it might be scheduling around some of their self-care routines um, involving their caregiver, thinking about compensation for their time. Um, so these are ways that we can incorporate their feedback and reduce barriers. 
often our participants come in with specific goals. So if we're trying to study, you know, how do we best control this robotic limb, having a goal like I think uh, Jen mentioned Jan, her goal was to feed herself a bar of chocolate. And so that was motivating and kind of synthesizing for all of us to try to work towards that, knowing that there needed to be science done in order to get us there. Um, Many of our participants have expressed a desire to be involved in educational or outreach type activities like the one we're having today. I think they're in a really unique position to share what their experience has been, what they've learned, what the devices are capable of today, and what it would take for it to be something that they would use every day. Um, and then finally, they can also serve as subject matter experts, right? So as others you know, are designing their research studies or as industry is designing products, um, as, you know, for example, the collaborative community, um, people who have had experience with these devices should really be included in, in those groups. And I'll just close by um, mentioning that the BCI participants have already started to self-organize in this way. Um, one of Ian Burkhart started this group called the BCI Pioneers as a way for um, people to contact um, individuals who have been a part of BCI studies before. Um, so yeah, thank you all for your time and look forward to the discussion. Um, I'm actually... Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to introduce um, Mr. Philip McKenzie. Um, so he's joining us remotely. He'll be on virtually. And, and um, he's been a study participant with us for over a year. I'm really pleased that he agreed to participate in this and share his experience with you. Um, he's a really remarkable person, both in, inside and outside of the study, and I look forward to you learning more about him. I think he's gonna start by playing a short video that just talks a little bit about his journey in the study, and then he'll tell you more about himself and his experience. June 17, 2012, I was tackled over a banister and I smacked my neck off of a gas meter and it led to me being a C4, Asia A quadriplegic. Um, I can not move my arms and my legs, but still trying to make a difference. I wanna be able to do stuff I just can't do now, you know. I have four electrodes on the surface of my uh, brain. Um, with connected two to each pedestal and uh, they are connected to the motor and sensory cortex for my right arm. It was exactly what, what I imagined in my mind a, a robotic arm would, would seem like, you know, it's there, it's my movement. And I just, I can't all the way feel the movement, but it's my in intention, so it's, it's pretty cool. I've done Guitar Hero or like a form of it. It's a mix of sensory and motor where I'm using my fingers to correspond with the colors. And then I'm usually feeling like stimulation from whenever I hit correctly on the note. I know that this research study is very important. It's gonna help a lot of people in the future and I believe that it's gonna do a lot of good for this technology to move forward. And that's why it's so important. How's everybody doing? All right, my name is Philip McKenna. I am a BC participant at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, right now you guys are seeing uh, me and my daughter, Monday. she is 12 years old, and the most important thing in my life right now, she is a ball of joy and always on the go, just like me. Um. In the top slide, you can see I wasn't always paralyzed. I got paralyzed June 17th, 2012, and um, she was eight months old. Uh, so she didn't really know too much of me on my feet. She's always known me in a wheelchair, and 
you know, it's never really changed, you know, uh, her outlook on me. You know, I've always been dead. Um, we can go to the next. Um, so this is my brand. Hashtag persevere. I am currently in the upstart of a company called Persevere Enterprises PGH. That is my company that I'm starting up to house myself as an artist. Easy does it for one too. And also my clothing brand and label Persevere Enterprises. I make music and have done so since I was 12 years old. But now, for the last five years, I've been working professionally and have made numerous uh, magazines, um, podcasts, releases. I'm on all platforms worldwide, and I've been working with Bentley Records since 2018. We can go to the next. I am here with the team at RNEL Pittsburgh. Um, and basically, I have known about the study since 2013. The team came to me and asked if I would be a part of the study. I was eager to learn more. I met Jen. I met Dr. Boninger and everybody else. And I had a nice experience when I came to visit. But at the time, I wasn't fully prepared to take that step. There was a lot of nerves, and I had a lot of things going on in my life at that time. I wasn't too, too sure. But I sat back, and I watched as the technology progressed, and I stayed in contact. And I liked what Jan was doing and, and the other participants. Nathan, uh, how, how they all moved on and they were, the technology was advancing. And so I, I definitely thought that, um, you know, in 20, 2020, I, I, I was becoming more and more interested again. And then 2022 uh, is whenever I finally made the decision to consent in and get implanted. And um, I've been working uh, with the group for about a year now, uh, a little over a year, as a matter of fact. And um, my experience has been great, not only for um, myself, but I hope for the team. We've made a lot of progress, I feel. And I think that we've, um, we've uh, built a relationship that not only is a working relationship, but a, a, a real a real family effort like you know some days i'm not really you know feeling too good so i might have to say hey guys i i, I can't make it they don't they don't sweat me about it it's not a big deal they they understand they give me a day and then i i pop back in and we get right back to work so it's all about knowing you know my limit um and I know that it's not a not a sprint; it's a marathon. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of this and, and to be a uh, with y'all today. And um, I, I appreciate y'all hearing me and giving me the time and space to speak. Thank you, Phil, very much. Um, we'll look for, we'll continue the conversation in Q and A. That is a lovely, some philosoph some philosophical regression thing is happening there. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us virtually, and we'll and we'll love to hear more during the Q and A. Um, I'd now like to ask uh, Dr. Nader Paradian to talk a little bit about his experiences, some challenges, and and talking about engagement through the lens of a physician scientist. Great, thank you. Uh, so hopefully you've all appreciated by now that we're speaking from different perspectives, from uh, an advocacy perspective, a, a patient participant perspective, a researcher, a PhD scientist perspective. And, and the perspective I want to offer is that of a 
physician scientists. And what I've learned through the process of participating in various early feasibility clinical trials, including brain computer interface trials, but also other ones. Uh, so this is the brain computer interface uh, trial that I've been involved with. Uh, this is with uh, Richard Anderson at Caltech when I was at UCLA. Um, and that is Nancy, and we'll come back to her in a little bit. Uh, but I also draw a lot of experience from having worked in a visual cortical prosthesis trial, which was a first in human early feasibility trial in which we implanted patients with uh, a cortical ray over the visual cortex in order to, uh, what I used to say was restore vision, but now I say provide artificial vision. And that has a lot to look, do with what I learned from working with the patients who participated in our trial. Uh, so from my perspective as a physician, uh, the goal of participating engagement and more broadly community engagement is really first and foremost to understand the why of why we're doing these studies. You know, it's a lot of fun to sit in my office and sit with my team and brainstorm and say, you know, it's great, we'll do a BCI trial to do X, Y, or Z, or a first in human trial of deep brain stimulation for some other application. But we are, it's very cerebral and very intellectual, and we figured out why we want to do it. But the real why lies with the patients, because they're living the experience, and they know what outcomes matter to them. And so that leads me to the first issue of really defining what meaningful outcomes are. And not only that, but a minimal viable outcome that is valuable to patients. Uh, I think that comes back to consideration of the benefits and how we define those benefits, including non-therapeutic benefits. Uh, acceptability of risks, uh, you know, what we think or what we know in clinical practice as a physician of what risks are acceptable patients, you know, I, I'll say, I know what risks are of deep brain stimulation surgery for patients with Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. And although it's easy for me to generalize and say it's going to be the same risks regardless of where I put the electrode, that's not necessarily true. And it took experience of being in these trials to figure that out and be able to accept that. Uh, the idea of trial design and the burden that trials uh, put on not only patients but also their caretakers and post-trial burden, and, and there are many other uh, inputs pieces of input that we can get from our patients uh, and potential participants. Uh, so again, thinking as a, a surgeon, a surgeon scientist or physician scientist, the, the first thing we always say as we've written ethics papers over the years from the Research Opportunities and Humans Consortium and other areas is that we're a physician first. Regardless of what we do, we're putting in an array, a Utah array and in brain-computer interface uh, participants, but we're a physician first. And when I think about what I do as a physician, when I talk about, again, deep brain simulation, because that's the most common procedure that I do, I spend most of my time with patients trying to understand what their needs are, what's bothering them, and what their expectations are. And I could say, as a mea culpa, when I started doing clinical trials, uh, that was the blind spot for me. I, you know, I would, I knew, I know, I would say, I already know what patients need and expect. I know that a patient with depression just wants to decrease their depression, or a patient with spinal cord injury wants to walk, but we don't know that. We don't know until we actually start talking to the patients. Sometimes we find out after they start participating in the trials. The balancing of risks and benefits, I, I said this already, you know, I, my blind spot was that I thought that I already know the risks of the procedures that we do. And you know, we've already done it in Parkinson's disease, we already put electrodes in, we know what it is, but it's risks, you know, you can quantify them, but the value of those risks may be different in different populations. The concept of safety, you know, we always say safety first in clinical uh, medicine uh, and safety over discovery. And again, what I've said over the years and I've caught myself saying is that I know what's safe and acceptable, but I know what's safe and acceptable to the patients I currently treat and what I think is safe and acceptable, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily safe and acceptable to the patients that we're trying to take care of. And finally, this idea of therapy over science. And this comes up a lot in these early feasibility studies, especially in brain-computer interface trials, the idea that we're trying to develop a therapy, we're trying to develop a cortical prosthesis, but in doing so, we do a lot of science uh, because we believe that understanding the science of how the brain works, which is what the brain initiative is after, will advance our therapies in the future, but you have to find a balance between those two. 
and you know, I found myself for the years saying, I know what's important for a trial. But again, that idea of importance might be different for what um, a patient wants or a participant wants uh, versus what I might perceive for that to be. And I'll share some examples as I go back to the case uh, studies of the different trials I've uh, been involved in. The other thing I've found is that there's been an evolving relationship as a physician scientist uh, with the patients who participate in these studies and my understanding of what they need throughout the studies. And I would say, you know, I really don't like the word research subject. I think most of us don't love that word. And I slowly evolved to saying a research participant, which is what I've been saying here. But in many cases, especially in BCI trials, in almost all early feasibility trials, they really become research partners. Um, they deserve as much credit as we do, because without them, we wouldn't be able to advance the therapy or the science. And I've had an evolving understanding of many different things. You know, what, how do we define benefits? Uh, and this was, it'll come a little later, but I'll say it now. The visual cortical prosthetic trial, I already said, you know, I, when I first started that trial, I had this vision that we're going to make blind people see again. And that was very aspirational. Um, and then I realized over time, two different things. One, our technology isn't good enough. But two, that might not be what they actually, what patients want. They might need something much less to have it be meaningful. But at the same time, I have to understand what tools they already have available to them, like their iPhones and all the tools that they have on there that already help them a lot, and know that whatever I'm trying to do is going to outperform the tools that they already have or fill a gap that they don't already have. No way to know that without uh, engaging with the patients in the community. Um, the other thing that Jennifer uh, alluded to was that participation really, there are indirect secondary benefits, and we can discuss whether that is something that we should count as a benefit of these trials. I am actually a firm believer that, you know, while we're working towards a therapeutic benefit, that these are benefits that are valuable, uh, meaning that these patients who are coming in three to five times per week and find that they are now giving in a way to society, just like we take pride and we get benefit from you know, doing science and running clinical trials, that that is a benefit that we should value, I believe, and you know, it could be discussed uh, for a while. Um, the goals uh, in terms of um, what we want to achieve, what success looks like, uh, this is a, a discussion I've had with uh, I'll call out the FDA. We've had uh, clinical trials for pain, uh, and where you know classically for pain studies, you want to have a 50% improvement in pain. But I'll say that a lot of patients will say, "Well, if I have a 30% improvement, it'll be worth it," and I'm willing to take this much risk. And we have to work through it and understand what meaningful outcomes are and goals of our studies are. Whether it's a quality of life, whether it's a quantification of pain, and how much risk is worth it. And, and I say that with a little with a little bit of joking because actually the FDA is the ones when with the visual cortical prosthetic trial who turned to me and said, you need a patient participation uh, study, uh, not a patient, a uh, patient preference study. And my first response was, why do we need that? I already know what I'm doing. So <laughs> not all bad. Uh, <laughs> Uh, complexity of participation, uh, again, impact on life during and after the study, and then impact on care partners. So ideally, we should understand all these elements with patients before we start. Uh, and then this idea about therapeutic goals versus scientific goals. I, I learned the most out of this. Uh, we see it in BCI trials all the time. We'll conduct experiments where we think about, you know, understanding the force, uh, the grip force, or other forces of movement, this velocity of movement, any kinematics of movement, is that really important to achieve a therapeutic outcome or to achieve clinical translation? We, we saw it in, uh, I saw it mostly in my visual cortical prosthetic trial where there was a company that was really trying to move towards a therapeutic translation, whereas a lot of us in the scientific side wanted to do some science. And so we have to find that balance between those two competing goals. And I would say in the end, you, know, you might think, well, the patients just care about therapy. But once they're deeply involved in these early feasibility trials, they care about the science too. The Nancy, who will I'll show in just a moment, liked seeing the, the scientific results and understanding what she was contributing to. Um, 
again, there's, you can do more or less, and there's an investment versus return, you know, how much of the science really matters? Those are questions that I think it's worth engaging with our uh, patients and community to understand more. Now, how much is too much? Uh, Ashley and I have done work over the years pr primarily focusing on these non-therapeutic, so basic experimental trials in humans, but there is this perception, you know, they're already in my head, let them do what they're gonna do, Let, let's figure out some science. As long as I've got a Utah array in my brain, let's do something with it. Um, but the thing that I wanna highlight here is this issue of trust. And especially as a physician, it's become increasingly apparent to me that these patients, once they see a doctor, especially a surgeon, I don't think a surgeon is any better than a non-surgeon, but there is a certain, uh, idea that you know you can get into my head so I trust you like whatever you want to do like you must be right um, and I think we need to be very cognizant of that as surgeons that to not take advantage of that trust as we think about how to design these trials so this is the type of work that we did our it's the basic experimental work where we record signals during deep brain simulation surgery but now getting back to um, the brain computer interface trials uh, I've worked with two different patients and we're uh, setting up another trial now at UT Southwestern and definitely had this evolving role, this relationship where uh, we went from, you know, just enrolling someone in a subject to really understanding that she was a partner over several years uh, and that she was contributing to it. I purposely include her picture here because she wanted her picture there. She contributed to these studies. She's probably more valuable to these studies than me uh, because all I did was put an array in the brain. I worked on some of the science as well, but without her, none of this would be possible. And, you know, so a question came up about, when we published the first paper from her, from what we recorded in her brain, she wanted credit. And it was a big debate with the IRB about disclosing her uh, identity because you know the, the confidentiality and so on and so forth. And so we compromised on publishing her initials uh, on the paper. Um, and of course she gave credit to have her uh, uh, image shown. And I think that's an important part. You know, understanding how patients perceive their role and what credit they want and not that it's just about credit, but feel, making them feel like they're part of the team. And that I think that promotes the science, that promotes the translation. Um, I could, uh, you know, I, I think I understood the, through the trial, understood the burdens of participation much greater. Uh, the, I talked about the science, balancing science and uh, translation. Uh, and uh, re really understanding what it meant to be successful. And like Jennifer shared about, you know, what people want to do eating a chocolate bar, she was really, um, Ashley had on her first slide a picture of her playing a visual piano. Nancy wanted to play piano, so we did that for her. And keep moving along. This is a study uh, where we put, uh, it's an ongoing trial with Samir Sheth and Wayne Goodman, who are at Baylor, where we want to understand, uh, we decided that we, to, to advance deep brain simulation for depression, we need to understand brain networks. And I mean, literally over a short period of time, Samir, Wayne, and I brainstormed. We said, this is what we got to do. We're going to put all these electrodes in people's brains, and we're going to figure out depression. It's a really cool study. We're doing it. We're learning a lot. But we had very little patient input, and we didn't understand the burden that went into it. Um, and we're glad we're doing it. But it's really you know, the trailblazers that are leading and participating in this study. And understanding the impact that could have on them is important. Um, and you know we have shown that we've had success with this with improved uh, outcomes. Um, and I've already mentioned uh, the visual cortical prosthetic trial, but I do want to say that this was a study that led up to it, which was a, a very interesting case example where before we actually did this first in human study, and I'll wrap up soon, uh, we uh, wanted to put an we wanted to put an off-the-shelf device in someone's brain to understand what it was like to stimulate the visual cortex, what we could do. There was zero therapeutic intent here. This was purely scientific. And the patient who we ended up studying, the first time I met with her, I said, I'm not sure we should be implanting you. And what she said with me stuck with me for a long time because she said, no, you don't understand. I'm blind. I want to be able to give back, even if this, this doesn't help me. If this paves a road towards developing a therapy for people in the future, it's important to me and I want to be able to do it. And I think understanding that perspective that there are people out there that want to work with us is important. And uh, we shouldn't close the door on that and just say it's completely unethical to do something like that where there's, you're doing an invasive procedure with no therapeutic intent. We should partner with the people who want to help us as long as we're doing it within ethical frameworks. Last, last slide here, uh, challenges and discussion points. 
we are reinventing the wheel. What I've just shared with you, my personal journey of doing clinical trials and learning about patient engagement, I learned a lot from people during my studies. I guarantee you every other physician scientist, surgeon scientist has learned all these things by trial and error. And that's a problem that we're reinventing it every single time. We don't have a way to, or we don't have a systematic way of uh, providing formal education of how to engage patients, how to do clinical trials in this way. Um, and I think that leads me to, you know, the NIH has tried to uh, work on this in terms of having a, a needs assessment as part of our grant applications. I think most of us will agree that it's a, um, people try and check that box, but I think it has to be, it's sometimes it's seen as a burden, like, oh, we got to get those three pages done because that's part of the application. It's actually probably one of the most important parts of the application, in my opinion. Uh, and that's worth discussion. And then the idea of adaptive trials. You, no matter how hard we try before a trial to design it best, I think we need to think about how we might take patient input as we are conducting these trials and modify them in order to meet patients' needs as we learn more. I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I said I was going to start with some questions, but we only have about 20 minutes or so for Q&A, so I'm wondering if we might just jump straight, I, straight to the audience questions or if there are virtual questions. Maybe I'll start with some audience questions first, and, and if there's a lull, I'm happy to jump in because I've got plenty. So yep. what percentage of the patients who've had Utah rays implanted have had a therapy, meaning they had open use of the device to do what they wanted with it? without a scientist there doing experiments on them. So what percentage of people who've been implanted for the last 20 years have had a therapeutic benefit themselves? Yeah, I think I would say zero, I think is where you're getting to. But I would say that some of the participants have been able to use the devices independently without a scientist at home for computer access. So there has been progress in that area. How many people in the public do you think know that? That's a good question. Hi, I oh, work can with... I, Phil, can you hear can us? We, yeah, can you see me? Yep, yeah. great, okay. Hi, right. I've worked with Argus two patients for about a decade now, and I found that a lot of them coming out of it are investment in the research is to advance future research, and they're fundamentally interested in understanding what comes out of the work that they participate in. And so I was just curious about, from each of your own perspectives, how are you informing participants that are interested in the research about the outcomes from the work that they participated in? And what are ways that we could improve that communication post participation for those people who have given their time and their brains and sometimes their bodies to the work that we do? Yeah, sure, I can start. I mean, I think the biggest way is just through publications and making those publicly accessible. You know, for participants who are still in our studies, I think they know the results of experiments whenever they're finished um, because we, we sort of move on to, to the next thing. But I, I agree that, you know, a good way, you know, there's not a great way to stay in touch once you start to get beyond a handful of participants. Um, we do maintain contact with all of our clinical trial participants after they're done. I think we've, we've found that we will share it on the fly. Uh, so as results come out before they're even published, we start to share with them uh, what we're seeing. I think the other thing I've done, which patients really appreciate, is I've done patient seminars, not necessarily for patients who participated in the studies, but um, from like, like my Parkinson's disease studies, where I'll just go into the community and say, this is what we've learned from stud patients who participated in research in the operating room. And patients love it. They love to see that the community can get back to understanding the disease and perhaps uh, understanding how we can develop new therapies. So if I could just talk from a broader perspective, um, this might not be a journal that most of this audience reads, but there's a wonderful journal called the Journal of Patient Experience. And there's several studies in there talking about motivations of why people join studies. Um, and one thing is we need to understand their motivation to join. And one of the ones that are always top of 
It could be that they're at therapeutic fatigue and they're looking for an answer, or it could be that they're looking to contribute to, to the community and looking to contribute to science. So there's a lot of motivations of why, and we need to understand that in the front end, but also the, the, not only the relation of publishing the results, but also communicating that out in layman's terms back to the community really adds value as to why the community understands why you're doing this work and what value it can bring to the table as the technology gets developed and further developed into clinical adoption. And I think that's a critical piece that sometimes gets missed. It's not just communicating it back to the participants, which they might, might know, but communicating it back to the communities so that when we start to look at broader community adoption and broader clinical adoption, that we're starting to build that awareness and communicating the science out to the public. Yeah, I also want to add to you know, this point about engaging with participants in order to learn what it is they want to be involved in. It's a little bit of a meta question, right? So we can sit here and talk about what are those really high yield opportunities for engagement to not only, you know, really fulfill some of these moral obligations, but also lead to, you know, good science is what I've heard on this panel. But there's an additional question is of what it is that participants want to be engaged in. And so, you know, after the trial, we've we've talked about many efforts for participants to be able to talk to one another, right? So how can we support that and build some infrastructure for community among participants across different trials to share results, but also maybe, you know, not not the good results. There may be things that have not gone so well. And so that, you know, from an ethical standpoint is something that we could be investing in. And I want to know, you know, I want to just reach out to Phil and maybe hear a little bit from his perspective of, you know, what are some of the things that you would hope for, you know, when this study is over for your involvement, you know, at the end? Well, I think that you bring up a great uh, point as like building, uh, we are a community now. Um, with us being in that um, that group of like that incline before it reaches the masses, so I think that um, community is important uh, between BCI users, uh, not only during the studies but after the study, uh, whether they choose to leave the implant in or get it explanted. And then also not only just um, us being in community with each other, but also doing outreach to the community and finding other people with upper body mobility issues and educating them about, you know, the, the opportunities that, you know, BCI brings to them. Uh, I just had a very um, interesting outreach with a bunch of kids um, from a local neighborhood and their excitement about BCI, it, it, it opened up another door in, in my mind that like outreach is definitely another, uh, branch off of the tree that, that can be done to keep people aware and educated about what's going on with BCI so that people aren't, you know, freaked out, like, you know, about maybe seeing certain, uh, you know, like you see my pedestals, but they're not, you know, huge. I could put a hat on over top of them and you won't even know, you know, so it's just uh, about making people more comfortable. And then, like I said, community. Hi, I'm... I'm Phil Troik, I'm from the Illinois Institute of Technology, and for the past few years we've been involved in a brain-based implant system for vision prostheses. And the question I want to ask has to do with responsibilities of the study personnel and the protocol limits with regard to confidentiality of the uh, study participants or volunteers. We've wrestled with this a lot because our IRB pointed out to us that our protocol does not delegate the authority to the study participant for us to reveal their identity. So it's not an issue of getting permission. They don't have the authority to alter the protocol. 
So we find ourselves in the position of neither being able to confirm nor deny the participation of someone, but we have told our participants that they can self-identify and talk to anybody they want to, reporters, media. I've seen a lot of presentations in a lot of forums, including this one, in which investigators seem to be identifying their participants in more than one way or another. Can you comment on this? Are, are your protocols written in such a way that it delegates that authority to your, your study participants? Yeah, I can say that in our consent form, there's spaces for people to elect, like opt in or opt out to disclosing certain information for different purposes. And so that's how we've built it into the consent process is for them to give explicit permission at that point. But then there's, there's a real border on you disclosing medical information about them. I mean, it gets really, really slippery quickly. And it just seems like there's a lot of ignoring of this in certain forums. And I, I just really would like to hear more viewpoints from the, from the panel. We all realize there's a benefit to the messaging that can happen. But at the same time, there are study responsibilities defined by the protocol that the investigators are not supposed to violate. Can you comment on this? So, so that's, the, I think that's the point. We're not violating it because the IRB has given us permission, has empowered the, so you're saying the IRB has specifically said the patient cannot empower the study investigators to disclose. Our IRB has given them the ability to consent to disclose that information and have their face and their names used. Yeah, but then that has to be written into the protocol because the IRB right. can't tell you to violate yes. the protocol either. Correct. So it's a compli I'm just pointing yeah. out, it's a very complicated topic that requires a lot of forethought I, because I it's a slippery slope. I agree, but I'll share one other thing that I think is worth discussing. We're living in a completely different world, as we all know, than we were 15 years ago with social media. We had a very interesting thing happen, uh, and you know, we had heard about the BCI pioneers finding each other with our visual cortical prosthetic trial with the pandemic they all found each other on social media and they were all talking, I have no idea how they found each other, but people will find each other. It's a, it's a small enough world now. And so that should make us think about whether we should be proactive and finding ways to do it in a legitimate way to get patient participants potentially connected because that's what they want. I, my personal, this will be controversial, uh, the IRB overemphasize, compared to what patients care about, the IRBs sometimes overemphasize confidentiality, uh, whereas some patients just want to be engaged with other people participating in these trials. And I think we need to find a way, you're right, Phil, to address this in a systematic way and consistent way across sites. So I could just throw out something that's a little provocative, is that you're right, in social media and the world is that, you know, the, at the end of the day, the participants also have their right to do their own speech of what their experience was. And maybe you as a researcher can't disclose that, but they can disclose it. And many of them do out in social media. But many times we put out the good stories, right? We love to put people out that are success stories, that are having a fantastic experience. And I think that's a wonderful thing for the field. But we also have to remember that in the world that we live in, in social media, there are also people that don't have good experiences in these trials, where the device may have failed and they're going to put that out on social media as well and communicate that out. So we have to also think about the participants' perspective of how they're going to communicate and what their experience is and how we, we um, help those participants in whether it's a good experience or whether it's a bad experience. But they have, they're, they're going to be communicating that out regardless um, because they're going to be talking from their own personal experience. Yeah, I, I was just going to add to this brings up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, Phil. I'm sorry. I just wanted to add real quick. Like, uh, I was, I was just saying, I, I'm all on social media. I mean, my whole independent career is on social media. I'm a, I'm an artist. I'm always under photography or videography, and so you know. People are going to wonder, you know, why do you have pedestals on your head? What happened? Why, why did you shave your hair? You know, and, and, and I'm not going to lie to them and tell them, you know, uh, uh, you know, something that wasn't true. I'm having 
a good experience, yes. But trials are difficult, long, and kind of boring sometimes. But that's the reality. I know what science is. It's trial and error. So, I mean, I'm I'm okay with it. I know that you're saying that I don't have the authority to disclose my identity, but it's going to happen. I'm in the public eye. Yeah, I was just going to just bring out that I think this conversation is also revealing that I think, you know, taking participant engagement seriously and actually letting those experiences and values have uptake, it does not just put pressure on the way that we do science, it also puts pressure on the way that we do ethics. And I think that was a really nice example of how the way that ethics and IRBs and requirements are structured may also need to need to bend if we take this idea seriously. And that's weird to say as an ethicist, I realize I hear it coming out, but I think it also, you know, reflects, you know, us as well in taking seriously the kind of ethical commitments and maybe those need to be looked at as well. Yep. Hi, um, I'm also an ethicist. Um, I'm an ethicist uh, who focuses on disability and uh, context to my question, but I, most of my work has been in the intellectual and developmental disability field, so those with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. Um, my question is actually more hypothetical because none of you work in pediatric BCI implantation, but from what I understand from the IDD community, when confronted with BCI technology, I won't say all or most even, but many of them have expressed concern or even complete aversion to wanting to do BCI. As I've noticed working in the BCI space, most of these patients have acquired disability and there is a focus on restoration. And I, I love how what you said uh, about res not restoration, but providing artificial vision. Um, but my hypothetical question is there is more focus um, and I guess urgency to get pediatric BCI research done on children who do have these disabilities, these congenital ones that those who are adults may not exactly want for themselves. So I'm curious with participant engagement, how you would navigate this knowing that the adults may be averse to BCI, those with cerebral palsy, those who were born completely quadriplegic, because there is no restoration there there's disability experience. So I'm curious how you guys would navigate that participation engagement. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. That's a, that's a very valuable question. I would um, lead you to the last neuroethics working group meeting that we had in February um, talking about pediatrics and a lot of the ethics around pediatrics. So, uh, pediatrics, so please view that. Um, but also, you know, your question also leads to not just the acquired disability, but the disability from birth. And I think we are starting, um, I know we've done some engagement work um, looking at disabilities that were from birth compared to those that are acquired. Um, and they bring in very different perspectives, especially when you start to look at adults compared to children. Now, have we done that work? We've done most of that work in adults. Um, compared to doing it in pediatrics, but from an adult's perspective, you're right. They're they're looking at um, they're looking at it from not the viewpoint of how can I restore myself to the way that I was before, but more so of how do I overcome the challenges that I face on a daily basis. So that changes the questions that we need to ask of what the device might be able to do and what the perspectives are on on what the potential is. So when we're looking at those different populations from not acquired or degenerative, but from birth, we have to start framing the questions differently. Um, so I think that's the, one of the challenges that we have, and that's some of the learning that, that we can do in this space. And you're right, it, it is an understudied area. Thank you for that question. Uh, hi there, my name is Zach, and I am a lead reviewer of neuro and rehab devices with uh, the FDA team. And uh, well, thank you, first of all, for your uh, diverse perspectives. Um, my question is actually for Phil. Um, I'm curious a little more about you know, your experience of, of participating in a, in a BCI clinical study. And uh, with regard to the informed consent process, well, Dr. Hollinger gave a great uh, 
description of the, the very involved informed consent process involved with participating in the study, but I'm curious if there have been any aspects of, of having a BCI or of participating in the study that have been uh, surprising to you in you know either a positive or negative way, and maybe what additional information do you think you might have liked to have before uh, deciding to participate, or what questions you know do you wish someone had asked you? from the beginning? Oh, that's a hard one because I was I was involved with the with the process thoroughly like understanding what I needed to do uh, after I consented. They did a great job of letting me know that it's going to be trials and trials and trials and it's going to going to take time and it's not you know a sprint it's a it's a marathon they they let me know that um so i i don't know i found it i honestly found it more surprising how easy it was to adapt to using the robotic arm that was like it was seamless i i think it was two weeks after i got implanted I just asked them, I said, can y'all just hook me up to the robotic arm? I ain't have no training. Just, you know, let me see what I can do with it. They hooked me up and I, I took it for a ride. And I was I was on point, you know. I was shaking people's hands and really, like, had the room smiling from ear to ear. So I, I was more surprised with how seamless I could I could integrate with the technology um they they really didn't tell me how easy it would be for real uh, i'm happy to hear that thank you you're welcome Hi, my name is Michelle. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I'm also really glad we got to hear from you, Phil, um, both about your lived experience and also um, bringing up the connection of family. It reminded me that not only when we're talking about engaging participants, there are a lot of other individuals that are probably involved, um, even sort of um, on the, the fringes of these kinds of studies, including caregivers, family members, loved ones, friends, other members of the community that hear about it. Um, and in my undergraduate training, I participated in a study where we would consent an individuals who were friends and family members of people who had suffered neural trauma, and they would fill out um, their own questionnaires about people who had neural trauma, and this was taken into account in the diagnosis process. And this suggested there's, there's a lot of valuable content from like close family members that can relate to um, accurate diagnosis and potential benefit and help. So I guess I'm asking, um, if we're talking about participant engagement, how far of a bubble should this expand to? Should we be talking about expanding it beyond the participants themselves and to close family members? And what are the additional ethical dilemmas that we now need to face in terms of maintaining confidentiality, the safety, and meeting all the needs of all of these extended participants? Bill, do you want to comment on that? Um, that's a hard one because I'm not really all the way sure what she's asking. Like keeping, like say, say for example, my daughter, keeping her identity confidential as in like publishing it or just like, what, what are we talking about? I think the question is whether you should have family or caregivers involved in the overall process of developing BCIs. Yeah, and sorry, just to be clear, there are some BCIs that might benefit patients that, for example, have disorders of consciousness who themselves might not be able to participate or actively engage, but their family members might. Okay, so I definitely feel like family support is important. Like, I probably I probably wouldn't have moved forward if, if my mom wouldn't have said, like, it's a good idea. Like, really think about it. Really take this into consideration. I was quick to just, nah, I'm cool. But after I really thought about it, uh, you know, it, it took for 
my mom to tell me to really sit down and think about it, you know. And then after speaking with my daughter, my daughter even thought that it was a a, a positive thing to do, and she's twelve. So it was just like you know, okay, we know the risks, we weigh the options. I think that family support is important, though. Okay. So, so I think. You know, looking at it, of course, people participating in trials need to have a support system around them to be able to to to, to be able to participate. That's incredibly important. Um, you know, one exercise that we actually did with um, designing a protocol is we did some community engagement, and it became very clear to those who were writing the protocol of the burden that they were putting on either a single family member or a caregiver, um, and that's actually led to the change of the protocol. Uh, because we automatically make lots of assumptions in our protocols of what we expect out of caregivers, what we expect out of family members, and don't necessarily involve them. And, and the situations of caregivers can be very different. You could have a very dedicated family member, or you could have somebody that uses a service um, as a caregiver, and that agency will not allow the caregiver to, to have any involvement at all in the trial. So, I mean, we really have to look at where, how are we involving people outside of that and are we consenting them in and how much are they becoming part of that trial? When you're thinking about conditions of consciousness, that really adds a whole level of complexity um, because that person might not be able to, to communicate individually, but um, you know, it's a matter of do they have a power of attorney or somebody else that have turned that right over to someone else to participate. Those are ethical questions that I think we really need to ask from the community perspective. And honestly, I don't know if we have a, a hard and fast answer to that at this point. Great, so I think, did you wanna say something, Phil? We're about to wrap up. Do you wanna chime in? No? Um, I, uh, I did, I did wanna, wanna um, comment uh, about the partnership it does feel um, like participating is like a partnership. Um, I don't feel as though I'm just a test subject going in to be tested on. I really feel like I'm making a difference and I'm helping the team. And so if we're, if we're you know, talking about is this something that should continue or is this wrong? I don't feel like, you know, this is wrong. And I know I'm supposed to be uh, real objective about it. Um, so I'm really talking from the scope of like, I looked at the whole thing and what I'm doing every day, you know, and I don't feel like a slave to this system or anything like that. I'm not coming up here just to you know, pipe everybody's heads up and fill y'all with smoke. This is real. I, I feel like we are a team and I enjoy the processes and I appreciate y'all time and, and thank y'all for having me. I know. I, I think that was a better wrap up than I could have done. So I think I'll leave it at that and just want to say thank you to you, Phil, and to the rest of the panelists and to the audience. And hopefully we can continue to have conversations about how to how to move this forward for not just ethical devices, but good design as well. Thank you.